Bereavement is a painful, stressful and difficult journey at the best of times. But grieving the loss of a loved one may be especially challenging during the COVID-19 pandemic. Often loss of life to the coronavirus is sudden and family members are unable to be by their loved one's side because of restrictions designed to stop the spread of infection to help us navigate these trying times. We are joined by clinical psychologist Corsi Gianna. Corsi, good evening and thank you so much for your time tonight. I'd like us to begin even before the process of death, the process of hospitalization has also been very difficult for many families during this time because some of them are not able to keep contact with their loved ones by phone or even video messaging or anything. And that's not knowing what's going on, you know, behind those walls in hospital. How difficult has this been for quite a number of families? I think, you know, people are thrown, um, to say the least, in that, you know, they, they are torn and thrown between and flung actually between hope and despair, knowing that they have to keep hope alive and they could, because they do want their uh, family member uh, to recover. However, the reality is that they don't know. And given the high rate of mortalities, uh, even more recently, it is always a prospect that people need to make room for, but one that nobody ever really wants to make room for. So it's always putting us on a knife edge of things with huge psychological uh, impact uh, on people. The stress levels are immeasurable, you know, uh, the uncertainty, just the anxiety that it creates. And, you know, wanting to start planning in case it does happen, but not also wanting to accept that possibility and keeping hope alive that things will get better. Mm, I wonder then, um, you know, is it, is it, you know, as, as some have said, more difficult around this time, given the regulations and the time in which we find ourselves in versus a death that could be maybe of natural causes or an accident? I think this time in particular has thrown us overall. And therefore, these deaths are part of that thrownness. You know, we have all lived um, throughout, you know, our human communities with the knowing that death is the one certainty. But we have always found narratives with which we have coexisted with the prospect of death. And those narratives have now been thrown. For example, you know, we have always worked on the premise that death comes with age, you know, and now things have been thrown around. Those people that have been considered at the beginning of this pandemic to be the vulnerable uh, group, uh, that has, has changed. So we are facing an uncertain um, enemy, one that is very, um, you know, uh, uh, mortal, one that's very um, debilitating in its effects, but one that changes all the time. And so we are never sure of where we stand. Um, and in all the measures that are, are propagated, um, you know, we, we can't exactly say that people are being reckless as such, although there is an element of that. Uh, but there are ways in which this thing moves in ways that we, some of us, you know, are grappling to come to terms with. And therefore, it presents us with an extraordinary circumstance uh, to deal with. And when it does happen, of course, you know, we have all these rites and rituals as human communities and families and individuals that we do that help us to process the passing on of someone, even if it's sudden from an accident. The fact that we have the time, uh, you know, to process the death and we have the presence of people that come and comfort and mourn with us and grieve with us in our loss, all that has been taken away. And therefore we are faced with the raw wounds and have to really deal with all of that ourselves. And the protocols around funerals have changed, you know, where people were able to, for example, have uh, rights of burial and rights of perhaps going to the mortuary, identifying the person, and for some people to wash the body and dress them up. All those are rituals that have helped us to process this death and to some extent come to a certain level of acceptance and release. Um, you know, the, the person to, to, to their journey. Uh, all that has been disrupted. And so people, it, it's literally like being, you know, walking into a wall and all those things stop and you have to take and process this, this sudden death um, and you have not had the time to, to even, you know, say goodbye to the people uh, because very often, as you say, said at the beginning of this, that people, you know, often rush people to hospital and as they are busy with this that and the other person is whisked away, they have never had the, ch the chance to even for themselves rather than for the person who's ill as well to even just say goodbye, you know. So people are just really, really re left 
raw by this um, uh, scourge um, and, in, on all levels. And I wonder then how do families begin to navigate all of this because the process of having you know, family over uh, for that week, because usually people would, you know, sometimes grieve for a week as they make their arrangements. The process of having family somehow, as you say, does create some kind of comfort and gives a little bit of a cushion. At the same time, the collecting of somebody's spirit in other cultures may be critical where they're able to go and have that process of speaking to that particular spirit and then carry it to, you know, uh, with them to the cemetery. Those things are not being done right now, as you say. How then do families begin to, you know, heal, to find a way in which they say goodbye effectively that's not going to leave them scarred for life? You know, I think I want to say two things. Uh, and the first is that human communities have always evolved. And all these rituals that we take for granted today have not necessarily always been the case. It has always evolved in relation to the environment, circumstances, challenges, and dynamics that people have found themselves in. And therefore, this is no exception to that um, you know, uh, social evolution. And so people will recreate, people will and do have to, and they do adjust um, you know, all those rites and rituals uh, to fit the circumstance. There will be symbolic ways in which people can continue to in some ways, you know, find some or create or carve out some sort of meaning with which they can live with the process, understanding, of course, that this is also perhaps a temporary measure and that rituals often take time, you know, take place over a period of time. So that when circumstances, people need to do what they need to do, only the basics that are necessary, bearing in mind that they also remain vulnerable. And so therefore, this is not a time to let down our guards. So it is about bearing in mind that we are at survival time and survival means keeping to the basics and that when the circumstances change, people will be able to revisit those rituals because people have always gone you know, to the cemetery and done certain rituals over time. And so people will, uh, I'm trusting, and I know that people will uh, you know, adjust and some things may change and we may not go back to them, um, uh, but some things we will be able to revisit, um, even also perhaps in a modified way. Mm. And what then becomes, you know, your, 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 your advice for families that, because right now, as you said earlier, it's not about age because there was that question that, oh no, maybe some people who are, are much older are, are likely to, to, you know, die. Even before COVID-19, people always looked at death as something that's final, but it may be a little bit far. But right now, it's not about one death that a family might be dealing with. It could be multiple people in, within that family that have, you know, succumbed to COVID-19 and thus having to start a process of grieving in, in a very unusual way. You know, uh, it, it is the magnitude is is totally overwhelming when you think about that. And you know, certainly there are families that have lost three, sometimes five uh, members uh, at the same time or close enough to one another. And we cannot even begin to talk about not just normal grief but complicated and compounded grief uh, because there's so many relationships that people have with those people. And so what it means is that you know, as human beings, we 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 are systemic. In other words this will have an exaggerated effect. Um, and we always say that, you know, whenever a traumatic event such as these, as we are facing right now, they will always um, inter interface with the existing, pre-existing um, infrastructure, the psychological, emotional infrastructure in the brain, in the person. And so those will be compounded. They will, they will, there will be an added toll on those coping resources. So stress levels are, are, are obviously going to be high levels of hopelessness because many family members will have lost you know uh, breadwinners um and and therefore there's the reality the daunting reality of what does it mean to now continue to live as we have to but under these circumstances where so much of resources with so much of not just uh, financial but social and emotional uh, resources have been eroded in families and families need to somehow find a way to regroup and um, say, you know, what is it that needs to be done? And to not necessarily take long-term view, but deal with the moments. What is it that is needed for today? What are the urgent things that are needed for today? So that we don't feel overwhelmed, but we just take 
control of the controllables in the most immediate way that we can and take it one day as a, at a time so that it becomes manageable spoonful at a time. But it obviously is, you know, for some people more than others, it may need professional intervention at some point, um, depending on, you know, obviously there is the expected element of grief um, and, and that, that accompanies the immediate loss. But over time, um, when that is not resolved, it complicates other things. So there may also be a need for a, converse, a professional conversation at some point. And Kosi, as we wrap up our discussion, what then, um, you know, of people that on social media keep seeing all these death notices that are, you know, popping up all over the place because that post-traumatic stress disorder itself does really affect people because even though maybe that person may not be necessarily close to you, a lot more people are starting to think about the possibility of their loved ones going through this and thus being, you know, heavily uh, weighed down by all this death that is currently now being reported on social media. How then do people who are using social media platforms, who are, who are watching the news, who are doing, you know, hearing of death all over the place, how do they begin to allow that, to not allow that to weigh them down, but at the same time co find a way of coping with this? Yeah, I think, I think what I would want to say is that we need to be so much more vigilant in guarding what happens um, in our mental space. Uh, and, and, you know, the principle being that our, our mind field is our mind field. So this is where we draw from. So you need to, to be very vigilant and discerning so much more now um, of what you let in. And we, we are thrown with so many com conflicting, contradictory um, uh, views on what's going on. And so we need to be so much more vigilant about what we allow to, to, to into our mental space because that will either strengthen or draw us down and, and have a debilitating effect. And so we need to, as much as yes, we want to be conscious, but we need to be discerning in terms of how much social media content we consume. And the minute that, you, you know, with each, uh, uh, whatever it is that you consume, ask yourself, has this helped me to feel better or has it uh, made it worse for me? And if it doesn't uh, help you feel better, then cut that out and move more towards things that, you know, prop you up and, and build up your resilience and your support, your coping, rather than things that are, you know, that draw from that. All right. So we need to watch over ourselves even more so. All right. Thank you so much for those insights and, uh, you know, those coping mechanisms that you've shared with us. Uh, that was a clinical psychologist, Kosi Gianna.